Joe Abimetin, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs from your home here in the UK. You are a counseling psychologist offering voluntary help and support to former cult members, including support for those going through litigious actions by the Exclusive Brethren, a group you were born into and left in 1960. Uh, so have you been doing jail during uh, the lockdown? Uh, do you work from home anyway, or has this all been a uh, kind of a new experience for you? Well, it has been a new experience. It's been a new experience for us all, hasn't it? And I think I've gone through mm. the whole gamut of emotions just like everyone else. <laughs> Strangely, at the beginning, the first two weeks, I felt all right because it was my decision to stay at home. But when the minute the sort of formal lockdown kicked in and Johnson mm. said, stay at home, I had a, quite a triggered response to that. And I think I wondered actually at the time whether other former members of cultic groups had the same reaction to being told to do something. Mm. But once I'd got used to it, um, I actually found it quite pleasant to begin with. Um, it was peaceful, it was quiet, there was no traffic, I could enjoy the birds. I do do a lot of work from home anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest difference, of course, was not seeing anybody, not being with anybody. And um, that has been quite hard. But over the year, I've swung, I don't know about anyone else, I've <laughs> swung through a whole range of different emotions, including anger at times, you know. Yeah. So it um, it has been difficult. What what's helped mostly is the fact that I have two amazing daughters. One of them lives in Melbourne, mm -hmm. and she facetimes with me almost every evening. And the other one, Jane, she lives not far away from me, about four miles away. So we've we've created a bubble, and so I mm -hmm. see I see quite a lot of her. So it ha it has been actually quite good. In many ways and I, I started these big projects as well which <laughs> some people said why are you doing this why don't you just yeah. have a rest you know but I, I thought it was important to keep myself busy and distract hmm. myself from being alone really. Jill you were born into the isolationist Christian sect the exclusive brethren a group that has featured in quite a few talk beliefs uploads over the years uh, before we get into your story of leaving can you just give us a brief description of the exclusive brethren how they began and uh, what they believe a short brief story is difficult because they've been mm. in existence for nearly 200 years now uh, it kind of began with a dissatisfied Irish cleric and, and a horse, and it was probably quite a cantankerous horse. <laughs> and towards the end of the 1820s, this uh, John Nelson Darby, who was an Anglican clergyman, was out riding on his horse and they had some kind of accident and he was quite badly hurt and had to stay at home for quite a long time with, with quite a debilitating injury. And he spent that time thinking and reflecting um, and he eventually realized that the whole notion of a clergyman was a sin against the Holy Spirit. And he thought this because by having clerics, that actually limited the Holy Spirit, who he believed could work through any individual. It didn't have to be a, a man of the church, man of the cloth. And he actually found a load of um, quite a few other similar minded people. And they gathered in Powers Court House in Dublin. And then after a few years, I think they moved to Plymouth, and that's why they became called the Plymouth Brethren. Ah, uh, yes. Um, yeah, so that's quite interesting. But these gatherings, in a way, could be seen as a kind of protest movement against the mainstream church and against clericalism, um, and also against the inclusiveness of the mainstream churches who allowed anyone to take part in Holy Communion, whether they were believers or not. And Darby felt that this was wrong. So um, he actually emphasized the verse 2 Timothy 2, verse 19, um, yet the firm foundation of God stands, having this seal. And I think that perhaps means that God's truth stands like a firm foundation stone with an inscription on it. Uh, and it goes on, the Lord knows those that are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord withdraw from iniquity. This is referred to by brethren and ex-brethren as separation from evil. And it's the interpretation mm. of that that has created this group, which many regard as a cult. I call it a cultic group um, because the separation was initially ecclesiastical, but it quickly became against individuals, um, mm. including other Christians. So that's the strange part of it. 
And it, it gradually over the last nearly two centuries now has morphed into quite a restrictive way of living. And they're more or less completely apart from the world, apart from, except for um, uh, work and school, well, even school now, they actually are, are separate from the world. So it, it's gradually developed over the years and become much more strict. Um, now, I'm not a theologist, but they do have a number of uh, quite peculiar uh, to them um, doctrines. One of those is the rapture, which the, which is the secret rapture, which is quite important because children, as children, we would be afraid that the Lord was going to come in the night and snatch up into heaven all those who believed in him, including our parents, of course. So if we woke in the night and mummy and daddy couldn't be heard, a lot of a lot of people have spoken about that fear that they felt. Wow. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, um, Darby was also called the father of dispensationalism. Uh, that's the idea that um, the ages of man, there are seven ages of man, we're currently in the sixth. And when the seventh comes, that's the millennium when Christ will reign for a thousand years on the earth. I won't go into that because it's quite complicated. Um, but another key one that actually affects people is the theory of the recovery. They believe that the um, seven, currently seven leaders of the exclusive brethren have been come mm -hmm. one, one after the other, actually follow on from Paul and that they are... Um, uh key people um men of god who are gradually recovering the truth that was once known back in paul's time paul began that recovery and these seven men um one after the other beginning with derby and ending with the current mr bruce hales from sydney um and in fact they're actually called the minister of the lord in the recovery when one of those was called James Taylor Jr. And when he came in, things really became very difficult, very restrictive. The rules became more explicit, more universal. And of course, with the internet, that happened even more because the contact was easier. The brethren actually claim they don't have any rules, um, hmm. which um, it's kind of shocked some people. In my day, they didn't have any rules written down, but they were there. You knew they were there. They were more implicit than explicit. There were things that the brethren did and the things that the brethren didn't do. And one of the difficulties as a child when those rules aren't written down is trying to figure out, so am I allowed to do this or am I not allowed to do this? You know? Yeah, not easy. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's very difficult. When people break these rules, whether they're implicit or explicit, they are first of all rebuked by the local priests and if that doesn't work, they are then shut up, uh, which is a kind of a form of house arrest. So they have to stay at home away from everybody. Um, and then eventually, if that doesn't work, they will be withdrawn from, as they call it, um, excommunicated. Of course, a lot of people also choose to leave. The, the terrible thing is, though, that the brethren, like other cultic groups, practice shunning. So when you leave, you yes. lose your family, you lose all of them. Uh, those that stay in you often almost always lose your job as well so it's quite a wrench to leave it's quite mm. difficult very difficult well you were born into the brethren as we've mentioned now this was in south london uh you and your family left the group in 1960 when you were 16. so what are your memories of uh growing up brethren this is the difficult part of the interview really of this talk mm between us today. I find it difficult to talk about my childhood. I think one reason is because I likened it once to a jigsaw puzzle that someone had, you know, I'd been putting together over my life and someone came along and swept the whole lot on the floor. Because my memories are pretty random and vague and disconnected. Um, I mean, over the years, I've tried to put them together and I've, I've spoken to the rest of my family to try and generate some more memories, but I don't have many. I think there was a huge expectation on us children to sit quietly and listen while these meaning, meaningless words drifted over to our heads, meaningless to us. Uh, one memory I do have is sitting in the Selston meeting room one Sunday morning with the street, sun streaming through the windows. In those days, the meeting rooms had windows, they don't now. 
and the church bells just down the road um, ringing out. I'm sitting there and feeling quite calm and peaceful, but at the same time aware that we've got one and a half hours of sitting here in boredom. <laughs> and I was always very grateful when my mother dug me in the elbows and said, Jill, can you go home? I think I've left the oven up high again. The roast will be burnt to a crisp by the time we get back. So I would quietly, quietly get up out of my seat and take the house key and walk the the way home. It's probably a good 20 minute walk and I'd go home and let myself in and make sure the oven was turned down. So that's, that's one quite amusing memory I have. Saved by the bell. Saved by, yes. Um, other memories of actually in the Brethren are, are gospel meetings. They were quite scary. They always had the children on the front row in those days. I don't know if they hmm. still do that. So you had this preacher who would be standing on a platform with a pulpit in front of him with his Bible open. Not, not a formal pulpit, you know, more of a book crest, I suppose. And he always seemed to be looking at me hmm. when he was talking about, you know, you must be saved or whatever it was. And I found that really, really frightening. And I know I often went home feeling really scared. But, you know, I had never had any thought of leaving myself. I never thought this isn't for me. I, in fact, I seem to have spent most of my life really trying hard to be a good little brother and sister when I was in there. That was my identity. I was brethren. At school, it was it was hard. I do remember some occasions at school being very difficult because the children shunned me, and I don't quite understand why. But whether it was because I couldn't invite them home, and I couldn't go to their houses, possibly that was why. You couldn't uh, eat with them either, isn't that right? Well, in those days, we could. This was pre nineteen sixty, so I had lunch at school just like all the other children. But now you can't eat with some of your brethren. No, no, but now they have their own schools anyway, so that's a sense That's right, of, the uh, focus schools. Yes, that's right. I mean, I felt quite an alien at school, and I didn't really make any friends, and I think it was because of that, because I couldn't. I couldn't invite them home. I knew I couldn't, even though I don't think I ever tried. Do you know what I mean? Um, and there was only one other brethren girl in my school, hmm. and... She was a bit strange. I won't tell you her name because she's watching. But, <laughs> but, um, Possible. We didn't anyway. We weren't we weren't similar enough to to make friends with, if you know what I mean. So it's um. I mean, my my thing. Um, I have had psychological help over down through the years. We'll perhaps talk about that later. But um, one thing that I've been told is that I had I have PTSD of the developmental kind. Probably I spent most of my childhood dissociated. So that's why I don't have many memories of it. Because when you're dissociated, you don't lay down memories. You don't remember mm. things afterwards. Right. I have happy memories as well, though. I wouldn't like you, everyone to think <laughs> I didn't. Most of those, though, were with my family when we went on little holidays around Great Britain or Ireland. You know, that, that was those were the happy memories. Leaving the sector age 16 was no doubt quite an upheaval. Uh, do you have any idea what caused your parents to leave? And what was it like for you as a devout brother and sister to be suddenly wrenched away like that? Yeah, that's the other trauma, really. Um, in 1960, James Taylor Jr. had, I think, been in the lead for about a year, and he was bring, beginning to bring in these new doctrines. And one of them was, is now referred to as the eating matter. He said that brethren should not eat or drink with anyone who was not in fellowship with them. This was all part of the separation from evil. Somewhere it says not even to drink with them, not even to eat with others. And um, my father was quite troubled by this. He told me all this afterwards. I didn't know at the time. I had no idea what was going on at the time. Um, and... Um, he had been troubled for some years, I think, because there was a previous doctrine to do with the Holy Spirit that he couldn't agree with. But this was just, I think, the last straw. And he, um, because he was a businessman, so he had business lunches or he had coffee, meetings over coffee or whatever. And this would tend to mean that he couldn't do any of those things. And he felt it wasn't scriptural. So why would he go along with it? So he and thousands of other people just left at that point. There was a huge split in 1960. And all my family came out, apart from my oldest brother, who is actually still in the group. 
Hmm. I had no idea what was going on. I just knew that there was a lot of tension in the house, a lot of anxiety. And as I'm talking about it now, I can feel that anxiety in my body as I'm talking, which is very strange. Hmm. Um, I just remember my parents whispering in corners. They'd made the decision not to tell us anything. They thought it would be better for us. I don't think it was. I think they should have discussed it with us. I just knew we weren't going to the meetings anymore and that we were now meeting in someone's house instead. Um, so it, it was like an earthquake. I think, I think there was definitely a kind of an earthquake feel to it all. And I, I, I wonder what was going to happen to me now if I couldn't be a, be a brother and sister anymore. Who was I? What was I? What did I believe? It was complete turmoil. Um, but we had nobody to talk to. My parents didn't talk to me. I had no one else to talk to. So it was uh, it was difficult. It took me a, many, many years to get over that. For the last 28 years, you've been carrying out research on the Brethren, talking to the media and presenting at conferences. Uh, so what is this research on the Brethren uncovered? The research on the Brethren was part of my master's degree in counseling. Um, uh, up to that point, I still hadn't had any therapy, and I thought there was something strange with me. I was having flashbacks and nightmares and so on and so forth. But the other students on the course encouraged me to do my research in this area. I think they thought it would be helpful, and they were right. And the first thing I discovered, I had um, 200, 201 participants, I think, which is quite a nice number. The first thing I discovered was that I wasn't alone. All these 200 people were experiencing the same kind of difficulties that I was. So that was a real eye-opener to me then. Um, and I began wondering what it was about the childhood experience hmm. that actually led to all these psychological difficulties. We're talking depression, anxiety, trauma, interpersonal difficulties, obsessive compulsiveness, and so on. I meant to re replicate that piece of research a lot earlier, but I only got round to doing it in 2010. Um, I think, I, yes, I had 264 participants then. I, I don't know what prompted me to do it then. I just had a hunch that it was going to be needed, and, and as it turned out, I was right. But that, that threw up some very interesting descriptive statistics. For example, 70% of the sample lost family, ah. which is high. 64% sought professional help as a result of their experiences. Of those, 67% um, made the choice to leave, which I think would be a lot higher than it was in my day. 16% were forced out and 18% 18, 18 left as I did because their family left or their spouse left or want something like that. And a massive 84% reported huge distress on leaving. Um, I just want to say something quickly about, well, hmm. before talking to a graph that I want to show you, I want to say something quickly about child sexual abuse. We've heard a lot about it in the news recently in other groups. Um, I was not looking for it. It just happened to be on a list of traumas and participants were invited to tick the ones that they'd experienced. And I was actually quite surprised when 27% of this sample mm. reported they'd been abused as a child. Now, I don't mm. know who abused them. I know nothing more about it than the fact that they were abused as children, sexually abused. Um, what we have to be careful about here is we cannot assume that therefore 27% of all former members have been abused. Right. We can't extrapolate, we can't, we can't generalize, nor can I, or do I even want to, say that therefore 27% of current members are being abused. That doesn't follow at all, but that is part of what the brethren hmm. um, used against me um, later on. They, they claimed that I'd said 27% of current oh, members have been oh, abused. And that, I've never said that, and I never would say that. We can't, we can't extrapolate from these figures to the current population. Um, if you want to look at the graph now, um, mm -hmm. so looking at the graph, um, I used a number of measures, but this is the quickest and easiest to sort of look at in terms of mental health. Um, it's the Sym Symptom Checklist 90R, which is quite a well-known questionnaire in use in, in psychological research. 
from from the research, um, we found quite a number of interesting findings, and perhaps the nicest one to look at is the Symptom Checklist 90R, which is a very standardised and over well used um, mental health um, questionnaire. And if we look at the graph, the red bars on the graph are the measurements from the former members of the Brethren, mm -hmm. and the blue bars represent the general population. So just a random group of pop of in the population were sampled. And so um, what I'm doing is comparing the scores from the former brethren with the scores from this general population. And you can see very clearly on this graph that the former members of the brethren were scoring significantly higher than the general population in all those subscales, but also in the overall scale. So we've got anxiety, depression, hostility, obsessive compulsiveness, and interestingly, the interpersonal sensitivity, because um, I wasn't sure whether my inability to relate easily with people was just about me or whether it was something that was much more general in former members of this particular cultic group, and it is. And. Um, and what it's, is somatization, the first one there? Somatization is when, um, when we put our psychological difficulties into bodily complaints. So the Chinese are very good at this. They hardly ever talk about depression. They talk about stomach ache. So oh. they experience it in their bodies. And a lot of ex-brethren do this at all. You'll, you'll hear ex-brethren talking about aches and pains. And when you try to get them to talk about what's behind those aches and pains, then it's much harder. Because we are a group of people who were taught to be silent, not to talk, not to question, not to critically examine things. And therefore, when we do have something that we need to talk about, it's very difficult um, yes. for that reason. So people tend to what they call somatize. Somata soma is bo means body, I think. Right. Now, that research ended in 2012 due to the litigious nature of the Brethren activities against me. And that perhaps is the topic for a different interview, yes. uh, the religious nature of, of the brethren. But we are in the process of opening this research up again. Having, having had that one closed down before I'd completed it, I had 264 participants, but I really wanted more to look at the different factors um, that were affecting the schools. And this time, I'm we're going to be looking at other cultic groups as well. I'm doing this with Rod and Linda Dubrow Marshall from the University of Salford. Okay. Very excited about it. Um, people often ask me, why do you do this? Why don't you just give up and enjoy yourself? Well, I think one of the big motivators behind it is not just knowing how damaged I was, but being very aware of children in cultic groups and i'm not talking here just about the brethren i'm talking about any cultic group where children are brought up in them there's a massive imposition is placed on those children um it affects their child development in so many different domains and um it can be really quite damaging and it causes pain in adulthood as well i'll never forget my mother's face when she spoke about my oldest brother who's still in the group the pain it stayed with her until the day she died. Mm. You know, that's a long time to experience that kind of pain. And her pain is small compared to some of the pain that other parents have experienced who've lost all their children or children who've lost both parents. It's that's where my passion comes from because I want and, to try. And you and, feel it yourself even now, yeah, don't you? Yeah, I feel, I mean, I still miss my brother. He's still alive and I miss him. And I, I feel other people's pain when I hear them talking about it. I have that compassion to to want to to change things somehow for the good, for the good of everybody. I don't want to destroy the brethren. Why would I want to do that? But I do want to help people, especially the children. Okay, let's talk about your current counseling work. So how did you get into this field and what sort of services do you offer? And do you offer cult counseling? Whenever I think about my life, I always sort of think that some things, some of the big changes in my life have just kind of happened. Um, I started out in occupational therapy and I was working in a mental health hospital. 
And I became aware as I looked through all these ancient medical records for these people who'd been there for 60, 70 years, that their problems started in childhood. And I felt I didn't know enough, so I did a psychology degree. When I came out from that, I went into maths teaching just because I could. And I had two <laughs> children at home and it didn't seem fair to go launch into another massive piece of training. Um, but then I was thinking about what I would do with that psychology degree. And um, I came across this MSc in counselling advertised in the, in the paper. And I thought, well, that looks interesting. So I applied and got a place. It was a very challenging three-year course, actually, and hugely helpful to me. But it it um, it spurred me into two directions. One, well, three directions actually, into teaching, actual therapy, and research. And as time has gone on, I think the mm. counselling side of the counselling psychology has retreated a little bit. Um, and I'm more interested in educating people and in research. So um, your question about whether um, I actually see former cultic group members, um, I don't. And for one reason, the main reason is because I, f I think I would be triggered by hearing their stories. Um, even in the structured environment of a therapy room, it is possible for the therapist to be triggered. I felt too close to it, let's put it that way. I felt my contribution could be made much better on a voluntary basis, via email, via phone, one-off ad hoc sessions now and then, um, through education and things like that. And it has actually worked quite well. Um, I have actually been running an email group for the last 22 years now. Um, as we've lost a lot of members because of Facebook and other <laughs> social media, but it is still going strong and we're still there. Um, it's, so ex-cult members can come to you? It's yes. just do oh, a yeah. diff different way than rather face-to-face? -face. Absolutely. I mean, I get lots of ex-cult members coming to see, coming, contacting me, mostly via email or via Messenger, occasionally via Twitter now. Um, they may have seen some of my um, videos online or read some of my presentations and so on and so they reach out for help which I give to them on a voluntary basis because it's usually just a one-off you know they they have a specific question or they they're wanting some material to read mm. or they want me to suggest somebody for them to go and see that sort of thing. Jill what brought you into the profession of counselling psychologist? Um, I think it was my background really the way I was brought up um, I was raised in a fundament, what you might call a fundamentalist sect called the Exclusive Brethren. And I think as I uh, entered adulthood, I became very aware that that upbringing had affected me in many ways. And I became interested in psychology and then eventually in therapy and counselling. So what was it like then being brought up in the Exclusive Brethren? That's quite a big question really, which would perhaps take a whole programme to answer. Well, not too long ago, you sat down with evolutionary biologist and outspoken atheist Richard Dawkins to talk about your experience. So uh, what, what was that like? When Channel 4 contacted me to ask me if I'd be part of the program and have an interview with uh, Richard Dawkins, I was terrified. You know, the famous Richard Dawkins, all these amazing books he's written and all these amazing things he says. Um, but I got a lot of encouragement. Quite a lot of it came from that email group I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and I read some of his, you know, got caught up on some of his um, works. But actually, I needn't have worried. It was such a fun time. I thoroughly enjoyed the whole the whole hour and ten minutes or however long it was. He really made me feel as if we were two academics just sitting in a London park. It's quite a cold London park, chatting over a cup of coffee, you know. And that's how it felt. And it was it was an amazing experience. And it did an awful lot for my sense of self-worth as well, you know, talking to Richard Dawkins yeah. and feeling okay about it. And um he wrote a book called The God Delusion. Yeah. Um and in that book he mentioned me, he mentioned meeting me. And he said, one of the sentences he wrote was about me. He said, I was a delightful and deeply sincere woman. So now, whenever I feel a bit down or a bit you know, dispirited, 
I say to myself, well, Richard Dawkins thinks you're a villain. <laughs> Been endorsed. <laughs> so, you, yes, exactly. so I can't be that bad. Yeah, no, it's a very memorable moment of my life that was. I mean, they only used a tiny snippet of the interview in the actual Channel 4 programme. But the um, interview is now, I understand, on YouTube if people yes. want to see it. Hmm. Jill, this channel is viewed by a lot of ex-cult members as well as those still within coercive groups who are searching for information and support and how to leave and how to cope if they do leave. So what words of advice would you give to people such as these who are maybe watching right now? The first thing I'd say is don't hesitate. Seek help, seek advice, educate yourself. Um, you now, and there is now so much out there, the internet, books, television programs, YouTube, there's so many opportunities for people. Back in 1960, when I left, there was nothing, no, inter no internet, no therapists, no mm. books, nothing about cults at all. So um, but now there are so many organizations out there. And I would also recommend that if you're not sure about whether to leave or not, or you have just left, find out about the group find out what their history is because i'm pretty sure you don't know it educate yourself in how these groups work educate yourself about coercive control and how that works and ask yourself does do these things apply to the group that i'm in or i was in um, education is incredibly important i think it 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 gives people power over what's happened to them um, a simple Google will um, help people find organizations in their own country. If you Google um, support for former cult members or something like that, you will find you will find them. But um, I do have a list, actually, quite an extensive list of organizations. And if you decide you do need therapy, please just make sure the person is fully trained. They're registered with whoever the organization is in your country. In, in the UK, it would be the British Psychological Society, um, the British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy, mm. uh, United Kingdom Independent Psychotherapists, and so on. So these big organizations that check that the therapists are um, uh, ethical and um, experienced and trained in the right areas and it really does help if that therapist already knows something themselves about how cultic groups work and about the cultic processes that go on i remember the first therapist i went to see the first question was so what do the brethren believe then and even 20 years after leaving i hadn't a clue i just couldn't answer her and in besides the the, the question was traumatic for me to have to try to answer so make sure your therapist knows the group that you've left where you're thinking of leaving and knows how these groups work okay that was a really interesting and insightful interview i'm very glad that there are people like you who can use the knowledge of their own experiences to help others i will leave links to your website and social media in the description below and all that's left to say is thank you once again jill coming on to talk beliefs well thank you mark for the interview I've, I've really enjoyed it and i just hope that it does help some people out there because that is what motivates me <laughs>